It was, said my wife, quite the ugliest thing she had ever seen. I had to admit that she was correct in her assessment. Norton Hall was a wonderful acquisition, an 18th century vicarage with landscaped gardens and 50 acres of prime land. Unfortunately, as my wife had duly noted, the folly at the end of the garden was another matter entirely. It was nasty and brutal, with unadorned rectangular pillars and a bare white cupola topped with a cross. There were no steps leading up to it, and the only way of gaining access to the interior appeared to be by taking a stout hold on the stones and hauling oneself bodily onto the structure. According to the agent, a previous owner, Mr. Gray, had built it as a memorial to his wife. It struck me that he couldn't have liked her very much if that was what he had built in her memory. Some damage to the foundations had been caused at some point by Mr. Ellis, the last owner, but he seemed to have thought better of his original impulse and had filled in the damaged area with bricks and mortar. My first instinct was also to have the blasted thing destroyed. But in the weeks that followed, I started to find the folly appealing. I know appealing isn't the right word. I started to feel that it had a purpose that I hadn't yet surmised, and that it would be unwise to disturb it until I knew more about it. How I came to feel that way, I can trace to one particular incident that took place two weeks after we bought Norton Hall and took up occupancy. I had taken a chair and placed it on the bare stone floor of the folly, then hauled myself up alongside it. I was just settling down with the paper when the strangest thing happened. The floor moved, as if for a single moment it had somehow become liquid instead of solid, and some hidden tide had caused a wave to ripple across its surface. I stood up suddenly, feeling a little light in the head, and saw a man standing among the trees watching me. Hello there, I said. Can I help you with something? He was tall and dressed in tweeds, a distinctly sickly-looking chap, I thought, with a thin face and dark, arresting eyes. And I swear that I heard him speak, although his lips didn't move. What he said was, Do not disturb the folly. Well, I found that a little rum, I have to admit. I say, I replied, this is private property. I own this land. You can't come in here telling me what I can and can't do. But blast it all if he didn't repeat the same five words, do not disturb the folly. And with that, the fellow simply turned around and vanished into the trees. I heard a movement behind me, and I spun around, half expecting him to have popped up there as well. But it was Eleanor. Who are you talking to, dear? she asked. Oh, no one, darling, no one, I reassured her. It struck me, not for the first time, that Eleanor appeared to have lost some weight in recent weeks. Or perhaps it was simply the way the shadows and the folly caught her face. It lent an air of hunger to her appearance, an impression reinforced by a brightness to her eyes that I had not seen before. It made me think of a rapacious bird, and for some reason the thought caused me to shiver. I followed her back to the house for tea, but I couldn't eat partly because of the way she was looking at me over the scones, but also because she talked incessantly of the folly. When are you going to have it demolished, Edgar, she began. I want it done as soon as possible before the bad weather sets in. Edgar, Edgar, are you listening to me? And damn it all, if she didn't grip my arm so tightly that I dropped my cup in shock. Her hands were like talons, long and thin, with hard, sharp nails, and thick blue veins coursed across the backs of her hands barely restrained by her skin. Eleanor asked, are you ill? Your hands are so thin, I do believe you've lost weight from your face. Oh, don't be silly, Edgar, she replied, I'm fit as a fiddle. That evening, for want of something better to do, I went to the library of the house. Norton Hall had been sold by some sister of Mr. Ellis, and the library and most of the furnishings had been part of the sale. Mr. Ellis appeared to have met a bad end, according to some of the local gossip, his wife had left him, and in a fit of depression, he shot himself in a hotel room in London. His wife hadn't even turned up for his service, poor beggar. I'd only been in the library once or twice. I wasn't much of a man for books, and had done nothing more than glance at the titles. It was a surprise to me, then, to find a book sitting on a small table by an armchair. I thought at first that Eleanor might have left it there, but she was even less of a reader than I was. I picked it up, and opened it at random, revealing a page covered in elegant, closely written script. 
I flicked back to the title page and found the inscription, A Middle Eastern Journey by J.F. Gray. A small, tattered photograph marked the page, and as I looked at it, I couldn't help but feel a nasty chill down my spine. The man in the photograph, obviously the titular J.F. Gray, looked uncannily like the chap who had been wandering around the grounds offering unsought-for advice about the folly. But that couldn't be possible, I thought. After all, Gray had been dead for over twenty years now. I put the thought to the back of my mind and returned my attention to the book. It was, as it emerged, much more than a journal of Gray's trip to the Middle East. On a trip to Syria in 1900, John Frederick Gray had acquired, through theft, the bones of a woman believed to be Lilith, the first wife of Adam. According to Gray, who knew a little of the biblical apocrypha, Lilith was reputed to be a demon, the original witch. Perhaps Gray's own words can best describe the events which followed. For I have kept his journal, if only to reassure myself that I am not alone in what I have witnessed. It was after midnight when one of the villagers made his way to our encampment. He told us that his young wife was sick and that he believed that the presence of the bones was responsible for her illness. He loved her, he said, and for a fee he was prepared to remove the casket containing the bones from its resting place and bring it to us. He was a man of his word. Within the hour he had returned, and he brought with him a lead casket, which he said contained the remains of Lilith. Then the tone of the journal changed as it took up Gray's return to his wife at Norton Hall, accompanied by the bones. Even the writing altered, becoming disjointed and almost illegible at times. Gray, it seemed, had begun to notice a change in his wife's behaviour. Louisa grew strangely thin, almost emaciated, and began to evince an unhealthy interest in the remains. I had kept them locked in their casket for fear of damaging them, before an effort could be made to assess their age. One evening, when I had thought her to be in bed asleep, I found her prying at the lock with a chisel. Her eyes were bright and fixed, and when I tried to take the tool away from her, she swung at me wildly, tearing my jacket and wounding me slightly in the shoulder. I fell backwards as she made a final effort at the lock, shattering it so that it dropped to the floor in two pieces. She wrenched open the lid and revealed its contents. Old brown bones curled in on themselves, with patches of tattered skin still adhering, and a skull, like that of some foul hybrid of human and bird, with beak-like jaws where its mouth should have been. And, as God is my witness, the bones moved. It was only the slightest thing at first, a rustling that might simply have been the bones settling after their sudden disturbance, but it quickly became pronounced, the fingers stretched as if powered by unseen muscles and tendons. Then the bones in the toes tapped softly against the sides of the casket. The dust began to rise, and the remains became surrounded by a reddish vapour. I heard a sound like the rushing of water, and my wife gasped. I looked at her and saw the vapour was coming, not from the casket, but from her, pouring from her nose and mouth. As I watched, she grew thinner and thinner, the skin on her face crumpling and tearing like paper, her eyes growing wider and wider in her sockets, as the thing in the casket sucked all the life from her. There came that tapping again, more substantial now, and through the mist I caught a glimpse of the most terrifying face, with elongated green eyes and skin-like parchment, its beaked mouth snapping and clicking as it rose. I shrieked and dived at the casket, sending the lid shooting down hard on the creature's head. I could hear it hammering and thrashing, and it almost threw me off, but I took the chisel and jammed it through the loop of the lock, locking and sealing the casket. The red vapour instantly disappeared, the thing's struggles eased, and as I watched, my beloved wife crumpled to the floor and breathed her last. There was only one page remaining in the narrative, and it detailed the building of the folly, the digging of its deep foundations, the placing of the casket at its very bottom, and the construction of the building itself above it in an effort to restrain Lilith forever. It was a ridiculous tale, of course, it had to be. Yet as I closed the book, I thought for some reason of Ellis and his wife, and I thought too of my own Eleanor, and how thin she had begun to look. I went to bed and lay beside her, but I did not sleep.
The next day I had business in London which could not be put off. I took the train and spent a frustrating day discussing financial affairs, a frustration aggravated by a growing unease, the source of which I only discerned when I returned to Norton Hall. It was dark, but I could see the marks of the tripod crane on our lawn, and a gaping hole where the folly had once been. The remains of the folly itself lay in a jumble of concrete and lead on the gravel beside the house. A figure stood at the lip of the hole, a lamp in her hand. As she turned to me, she smiled, a ghastly smile, filled, it seemed to me, with both pity and malice. Eleanor, I cried, no! But it was too late. Below me, Eleanor was scraping at the dirt with her bare hands, slowly revealing the curled, skeletal figure of a woman, still wearing a tattered pink dress, and I knew instinctively that this was Mrs. Ellis, and that she had not run away from her husband. By now, Eleanor's scratching had revealed a metal object, dark and ornamented. I started down the ladder after her as she took a crowbar and tore at the lock which Gray had placed in the casket before he buried it. I was on the final steps of the ladder when a wrenching sound came, and with a cry of triumph, Eleanor threw open the casket. There, just as Gray had described it, lay the curled-up remains and the strange pointed skull. Already the dust was rising, and a thin red trail of vapour seeped from Eleanor's mouth. The crowbar fell from her hands, and I grabbed it. I closed my eyes and struck. Something screamed, and the skull broke with a hollow, wet sound, like the opening of a melon. The creature fell back, hissing, and I slammed down the lid. At my feet, Eleanor lay unconscious, the final traces of the red vapour coiling slowly between her teeth. Just as Gray had done years before, I took the crowbar and used it to jam the lock. From within the box came a furious hammering, and the crowbar jangled uneasily where it rested. I placed Eleanor over my shoulder and with some difficulty climbed the ladder to the ground above, the thumping noises from the casket below fading. I drove her to Bridesmouth, where I placed her in the care of the local hospital. She remained unconscious for three days and remembered nothing of the folly or Lilith when she awoke. While she was in the hospital, I made arrangements for us to return permanently to London. And then one bright afternoon, I watched as the hole in the lawn was lined with cement, strengthened with steel bars. Molten lead was poured into the hole, hissing and smoking, three containers of it, until the hole was almost half full. Then the workmen began the task of laying new foundations for a second folly, larger and more ornate than the last, to cover the hole. It cost me a year's income, but I had no doubt that it was worth it. I take it the missus didn't like the last folly, Mr. Webster, said the foreman as the lead cooled. I'm afraid she didn't, I replied. The funny creatures, women, he continued. They had their way, they'd rule the world. But they never will, will they? No, I said. They won't. At least I thought not if I have anything to do with it. <laughs>